Here is a map of the city centre of Cambridge. I've colour-coded the roads with a simple estimate of how much traffic we'd expect them to carry. What I did to produce this estimate was very basic. I just downloaded the OpenStreetMap dataset. I selected the vertices and edges inside this part of Cambridge. And I imagined that for every pair of vertices on the map, there's someone who wants to drive between them. And then I just found the shortest paths. That is one shortest path for every pair of vertices on the map. And then I counted up how many of these shortest paths pass through each edge. That's my estimate for what the likely demand is. And that's what the colours here are showing. You may have come across this idea before if you've taken a course on networks and data science. This metric, the number of shortest paths that use a given edge, is called the betweenness centrality of the edge. I'm just throwing this out in case you're interested in the idea. We're not going to need it for the algorithms we're studying, but it's good to know. Anyway, back to the Cambridge city centre. It has this one edge right in the middle of the graph, which turned out to be the busiest of them all. And a few years back, there was a big redevelopment of a shopping centre there, the Grand Arcade, and the city council in their wisdom decided to put a great big parking lot exactly in that spot, which means that the most used road in all of Cambridge spends most of its life with cars backed up waiting to get in and out. OK, back to algorithms. What's behind this picture is computing minimum weight paths between all pairs of vertices in the graph. So let's ask the question, how should we compute them? What's the cost of finding all to all minimum weights in a graph? The first thing that comes to mind is to run Dijkstra's algorithm. We'd run it v times once from each vertex. Each time you run it, you get the distances from a particular vertex to all the other vertices. So running it once from each vertex will give us all to all distances. And the total cost is V times the cost of a single run, V times big O of E plus V log V. What if there are some negative weight edges in the graph? Dijkstra's algorithm isn't safe. It may get stuck in an infinite loop. So we have two candidates. The Bellman-Ford algorithm, which again we could run v times once from each start vertex, or the dynamic programming method, which computes all to all minimum weights in big O of v cube log v if we use the cunning matrix implementation that I mentioned in the last video. To make sense of these different formulae, I find it helpful to see what they say for particular types of graph. Let's look at two extremes. I look at a tree, which has e equals v minus 1 edges, and I look at a fully connected directed graph, which has v times v minus 1 edges. If we stick in those values for e, these are the running times we get. Actually, scrub that. Here's a way to get an even clearer comparison between the three algorithms. Let's consider a graph where e grows like v to the alpha, or more precisely, e equals big theta of v to the alpha for some alpha. If we set alpha equals 1, we get the tree case. If we set alpha equals 2, we get the fully connected case. So this general case for alpha between 1 and 2 encompasses the full range of graphs that we're interested in. So for e equals big theta of v to the power of alpha, here are the running times. And this way of writing it makes it clear that in all cases, Dijkstra's algorithm is best. But of course, the downside of Dijkstra's algorithm is that it only works on graph where all the costs are above or equal to zero, whereas the other two work when some costs are negative. What we're going to talk about in this video is a very clever algorithm called Johnson's algorithm, which has the same running time as running Dijkstra from every vertex, but which also works with negative edge weights. Now, Johnson's algorithm is very cunning. There are some algorithms where I think to myself, hey, I could have invented that. It's just a matter of trying out examples, generalizing, seeing what goes wrong, generalizing some more and so on. But for me, Johnson's algorithm comes out of the blue with a really creative leap, and all you can do is sit back and admire it. Now, the reason why I want to talk about Johnson's algorithm isn't really because I care all that much about all to all shortest path algorithms. It's because Johnson's creative leap shows off two new strategies for algorithm design, 
And these two strategies will play a really big role in the rest of the course. But to explain what these strategies are all about, we need to see what Johnson's creative leap is. So here's his algorithm. First, we'll start off with the graph in which we want to compute all to all minimum weights. Let me define W of U to V to be the weight of that edge U to V. Next, we define an augmented graph, which has one extra vertex, call it S, and it's got zero weight edges connecting S to each of the other vertices. And on this graph, we'll run Bellman Ford to find the minimum weights from S. So for example, if we look at this vertex here, there's a path from S to this vertex of weight naught plus minus two plus minus one. That's the minimum weight path. So we give this vertex a value minus three. Next step, define a helper graph. This helper graph will have exactly the same vertices and edges as the original graph, but its edge weights are different. They come from this formula here. So for example, take this edge, we'll give it weight seven, which is the D value at the start vertex, zero, plus the original edge weight, four, minus the D value at the end vertex, minus three, giving total weight seven. Next, we run Dijkstra's algorithm once from each vertex to get all to all distances in the helper graph. And let's call these distances distance prime. Finally, there's a translation step. We've just computed distances in the helper graph. We want minimum weights in the original graph. And there's a simple way to get at them. We just use those D values that we computed in step one, and that turns out to work. Why it works? Well, that's a complete mystery until you see the proof, and then it'll become obvious. But we, before we go on to the proof, just a few comments. First comment, in this helper graph that we designed in step two, all the edge weights turn out to be above or equal to zero. That's pretty easy to show, and we'll show it in a moment, but what it means is that step three is safe. Dijkstra's algorithm won't get stuck in an infinite loop. Next remark. Let's have a look at the running time of each of these steps. Step one, running Bellman Ford on the augmented graph, takes time big O of V times E. The Dijkstra step takes time V times big O of E plus V log V. And the final translation step takes time big O of V squared to go through all pairs of vertices. And adding them all up, the first term and the third term are subsumed by the second term. In other words, the running time is essentially the running time taken up by Dijkstra. The rest is of the same order of magnitude, at least in an asymptotic sense for large V and E. Okay, that's the algorithm. Now let's highlight the two big ideas behind it. Idea number one, the translation strategy. What this means is that we create a helper problem of some sort, find the solution to the helper problem, and then we translate that solution back into our original problem. Ideally, the helper problem is easier, or maybe you just have a library routine for it kicking around somewhere and you want to save time programming, or maybe you know some theorems about the helper problem which you think might be useful. And idea two, the amortization strategy. What this means is we do an expensive one-off piece of work in the anticipation that it will pay itself off over a whole load of other steps. In this case, Bellman Ford is expensive, but it pays itself off because it allows us to run the much cheaper Dijkstra's algorithm for all the V vertices we want to run it from. We're going to see a lot more of these two algorithm design strategies in later videos. Okay, let's get down to business and we'll go through the proof. You don't need to learn the proof, but I want to include it anyway because I think it's beautiful and it's really short too. And it's just nice to see something that's so clever and so simple. First, let's prove the result about weights in the helper graph. This is what we want to prove, that the edge weights in the helper graph are all above or equal to zero. 
Let's just remind ourselves what the helper graph is and how its weights are defined. And now the proof. Let's consider an arbitrary pair of vertices, u and v, with an edge between them. The big idea of edge relaxation, the whole basis of Dijkstra's algorithm and of Bellman Ford, was this, that the min weight to v must be less than or equal to the min weight to u plus the weight of the u to v edge. This is just saying the path from s to v via u is a legitimate path to v, it's one of the candidate paths that we should be considering, and the min weight from s to v must be as good as this path or better. And all we need to do is rearrange this equation, bring the d sub v term onto the other side, and we get the expression for the edge weights in the helper graph. Okay, so I've shown that all edge weights in the helper graph have weight above or equal to zero. Next, let's talk about the translation step of the algorithm. The idea of the algorithm is that we'll find shortest paths in the helper graph, and this is meant to tell us about shorter paths in the original graph. So let's just go ahead and look at a typical path. Let's suppose we have a path v0, v1, dot, dot, up to vk. Let's write down expressions for this path's weight in both of the graphs. The weight of a path is just the sum of its edge weights the sum of the w's on the left, the sum of the w primes on the right. And now, the magic. Let's expand the sum on the right using the definition of w prime. Each w prime expands into something with d's and w's. And the magic is that the d's all cancel out, all except the first and the last. And so this is what we end up with. So what we've shown is that the weight of a path in the helper graph is equal to the weight in the original graph plus a correction term, and this correction term depends only on the start and the end vertices, not on the rest of the path. By the way, this sort of algebraic trick where lots of intermediate terms all cancel each other out, this is called a telescoping sum, and I always find it so satisfying. Okay, let's restate our finding. We've shown that the weight of any path in the helper graph is equal to the weight in the original graph plus a correction term, and the correction term depends only on the start and end vertices, not on the rest of the path. Therefore, if we find the shortest path between a given pair of vertices in the helper graph, the same path must be optimal in the original graph. The weight of the path will be different, of course, and this formula tells us exactly what the offset is, but the identity of the path, the sequence of vertices, that's got to be the same. And that, that's the magic trick behind Johnson's algorithm. As I said, I'm interested in this algorithm more because of how it showcases two interesting design strategies, the translation strategy and the amortization strategy. In the next section of the course, we're going to shift our attention away from shortest path problems, which we're pretty much done to death now, and we'll look at problems to do with finding substructures inside graphs. And the translation strategy will play a very big role in what's coming up next.